and welcome you and thanks for coming. Appreciate it. This is a first meeting in June, June 15th, and I'll go over the agenda that we have. So this is what we're going to talk about. And let me just discuss the plan for the program here tonight. I'm going to go through a deck. And the PowerPoint deck is just going to go through these topic areas. We're going to end with a Q&A and a roundtable with everybody. One of the things that we want to plan tonight and also reach out to anybody who couldn't make it tonight is mentor visits. So I'll talk about that. And ideally, what I want to do is do what we typically do. Where should you be? What should be going on? Uh, what, are, what comes next? What should, should you be planning for? And then we'll talk about, um, excuse me, the question and answer. You can ask whatever questions or share like round table. We can all learn from what we have going on in everybody's colonies. So uh, first thing I'll say is this is our typical what happens. And most people started in February. And we typically count the calendar year out till December. We're right in the middle or end of summer management about to head or spring management about to head into summer management. And ideally, everything we do from the beginning of the year is to plan to get to the point where our bees can be put together there for winter to uh, overwinter state and You'll hear me talk a little bit about the things that this time of year where the focus is on that. We're right in the 6, 8, 6, 15 range for mentor visit plans. And we're heading into summer management. And as I said, we're, we're trying to get a head start on summer management to get to winterization. That's pretty much what, what our agenda focus is, objective tonight. If you look at it, you should have been to the second box sometime in mid to late May. And as you see, we're looking to plan mentor visits with mic checks this week, next week, following week. And ideally, everybody, whether you started from a package or whether you started from a nuke, will get to two full boxes. By the time traditionally the dearth arrives here in New Jersey, around the first, you know, just after 4th of July, which is coming up very quickly. If you think about fall management, you'll have the fall forage and we'll continue to check for mites. But one of the focus from here on out is to have healthy bees so that they build the winter bees through summer and fall and get us to 60 pounds of honey storage and a population that will sustain the colony very well over winter. So again, I'm always looking ahead so that what we're planning now leads us to what we need to be for fall and winter preparation. When we think about summer management, which is where we go next, we have to focus on feeding the bees when the forage dries up and we have to focus on varroa mite management. This is the time you have to consider that, and I'll talk more about the population dynamic. The varroa mites are at their peak population and growing to the point where they'll be impactful to the bees. Summertime, bees are rotating out of the colony because they're being replenished all the time. But when they get to the point where they stop producing brood, then the bees that are in the colony live with whatever raw mites are there and get impacted. So again, forager might go out in summer and live for one to two weeks. And if it passes on, which it does, it's replenished by a fresh new bee. But when they're hanging around and raw mite are chewing on them and they're down in the cells and so on, it changes the dynamic of varroa impact to the bees. And during the growth period of summer, the bees outpace the varroa mite, but varroa mite catch up at some point in the curve. So if you look at the full progression, we started at the left with 
either a nuke or a package, and we built all the way to a single box. Then we got to the second box sometime in the May timeframe by the picture. And then eventually that second box starts to fill out. You might be here, or you might be to the point where you've already filled out both your boxes or you're on the cusp of that. And some of the beekeepers I've discussed, they're here. Their bottom boxes are filled out, especially if they had drawn comb and they've got their honey supers on and they should be building comb in the honey super. We want to work with you, as some of you have expressed, to correct any problem situations and what could be happening. They're too small, then why? What's going on? If they're not healthy, which is possible, bad brood patterns, queen didn't lay well, not a big population because something's going on inside, um, we'll try to straighten that out for you. Sometimes queens are duds. They're not good. Um, they have poor patterns and so on. And the time to correct that situation for any of your colonies, some of what I heard before we even signed on tonight, is now. And I want to take a moment and say, there's different approaches and we can guide you through it. But to rear a queen by letting the colony do it now is probably not a good tactic. The explanation for that is the time it takes for them to pick a larva, generate a queen cell, queen cell gets capped, queen emerges. She waits a few days, she goes out, she gets mated, she comes back. It takes a month, maybe even longer for that full cycle to occur. You can't afford a month at this time of year to get a colony up and going. If the colony is not two boxes deep and you need to get it to the point where it's at a state that it can overwinter. So there's no time at this point to mess around and have them draw their own queen. Now, certain circumstances, you might give them brood if you can't find a queen, just to check and see if they would build a queen. And if they start to build a queen, then you know they're queenless. You can shortcut the process by just then tearing down the queen cells personally and put a queen in it, something like that. Every situation is different. And if you are experiencing anything that's going on here, we'll consult with you on the side and we'll give you some guidance. And again, we're about to come visit people just to check in and see how things are going and you'll hear more about that in the program here so i'm going to switch gears here and just say if you are having problems now's the time for us to come figure that out for you and give you some assistance and some guidance and we'll come back to ask you questions and if you do have a situation you could talk about it i kind of like first off i'm sympathetic if you're having problems sorry but it, sometimes it comes with the territory. But it, for those who are not having problems to hear other people's problems and learn from it is important because guess what? Next season, it could be you, right? We want you to purchase a, one of these devices. If you don't have one, we made the recommendation before, but we have people who are new to the call. Uh, please go to your B catalog website, whatever it is, Stan Wasatowski and order one of these. We want you to get in the habit of checking your mites. And this is the tool that we advocate using. I'll talk about this in just a second. There's some other things we want you to take care of. The first one is this is a hive top feeder. During the summertime, when you have to feed the bees, internal feeders are okay. Hive top feeders, you do not have to um, you take the roof off, you don't have to go into the colony and you could deliver more food this way. So we would say, you know, if you have two hives, you should have two feeders. These are man lake feeders. I call them man lake feeders because almost everybody buys them from man lake. Every catalog probably sells these, uh, buy them pre-made, right? You can buy the the bottom shows you 
inserts that you can buy and build your own, but just buy the whole box. Make sure you have a B brush. When we come in to do Varroa mic monitoring, um, it would be helpful to have one of these. And then we recommend you use fuel for the smoker, use pine needles. And we'll come in and show you how to light your smoker and such. So when we come to visit you, please have those things available at the time that we arrive. There's an optional thing if you want your queen marked and the mentor who comes to visit you is on board with it. If you have a queen marking system, this year's color is yellow. Uh, we will mark your queen for you if we spot her during the inspection. So optionally, while you're grabbing some stuff, um, you know, do consider buying a queen marking kit. There's a bunch of different kinds in here. Simply the little tube with the sponge and these markers. Some people buy model paint, you know, like testers that you would build a model out of. Uh, they're quite a bit less expensive than these actual made for queen marking pens. But, you know, if you're only buying one yellow one this year, then it's not that big of an expense. To be more specific about the stuff we need, we'll need a hive top feeder. We need one of those easy check. When we get there, we would like you to have some rubbing alcohol so that we can do the test. We want you to have a Rubbermaid tote, uh, one that's, you'll see why in a second, one that's probably like 10 by 20. You should be considering sugar to feed your bees during the summer if you haven't done that yet. Obviously, we need smoker and fuel. And one of the things we're going to recommend is a hive inspection form or something to take notes with. So I'm going to go a little further down the rabbit hole with this. But first, I want to talk about mite dynamics. If you haven't figured it out, Varroa mites enemy number one. and they're always there. They impact the bee in multiple ways. Primarily, they feed off the bee where they cut the bee from where they bite onto it and wound the bee, just like if you cut your skin or something. They do take in some hemolymph and they also feed on the fat body. This is too much information and you'll never get tested on it. But one of the things they're after is egg yolk precursor that they get from the bee. The egg yolk precursor comes from the fat body and it actually is imperative for Varroa mite to get that from the bee so that it can lay an egg. It can't do it by its own because it can't make that. So they are absolutely going to bite onto the bees and go get that material. It's imperative for their survival. What I was alluding to earlier is one mite could generate many generations of mite. And then every single mite that it makes, two, three, four, six, will go off and generate their own two, three, four, six number of mites, depending on what it's doing. So for every bee that emerges that had a varroa mite in it, four to six varroa mites come out. And you can imagine that over time, with all the bees carpet or brood that comes through, if there's a varroa mite in a cell, there's a massive amount of varroa mites that could be generated over generations of bees being uh, created by the queen. Varroa mites favor the frames where the brood is because that's their food. They feed on the bees and they feed on the larva. They gravitate to the area where brood pheromone is emanated from the bees calling out to their sisters to feed them and other things going on. And uh, obviously they feed off of developing brood. So if you were gonna search for a Varroa mite in a colony, where would you look? You'd have to look in the brood area. Just keep that in mind when I tell you something in a moment. This is the typical mite population dynamic where they go into the cell 
as they go around the wheel, they generate offspring. As the bee gets to the point where day 21, it's going to emerge. There are multiple varroa mites and nymphs and whatever in there. Now, depending on whether it's a worker or a drone, because drones have more cycles, you see on number 24, that's the picture of a drone coming out. Um, this is hard to see. I get it, uh, but I'll explain it. If you look at day 21, it's around 10 o'clock on the diagram. The mite that, that are on the picture of the bee, there's a dark red one, there's two kind of light red ones, and there's one that's golden color. Those are to signify the maturity of the mite in its development. Down at the bottom, there's a couple little white. They don't survive. But if it had a couple more days, you could see on 24 for the drone, because it takes 24 days, that the mites coming out, there are four or five of them, maybe six of them on the body of the bee. All they need is those couple more days and they could successfully generate more. If you think about the time period now, how many drones do you have in your colony? When you have more drones in your colony, you should imagine that there's more varroa mites. When we get to the end of June and July, the queen stops making drones. They don't need them anymore because the queen's period is mate, of mating is over. All the varroa mites that were on the drones switch to the workers. So not only do the workers have lots of varroa mites, but all of a sudden, all of the workers end up with all of the mites because there's less drones for the mites to feed on. It's a one-two punch for workers, and it makes them sick right at the time when they should be heading into being healthy in order to switch over and start generating winter bees in summer and early fall. So again, no test on this, just some basics of how varroa mite dynamics occur. But without mite management, healthy colonies implode. And it's always this time of year. And some of you might say, well, my colony looks fantastic. It's strong, it's got lots of bees, they're making honey, they built all their comb, they did all that, great. But in short order, if you don't resolve a mite problem that manifests, your colony is going to turn south very quickly and you're going to say, what happened? I'm not going to bludgeon you with this. I'm just trying to give you some sense of population dynamic. Now, one thing you might say, well, how do I know whether I have mites or not? One thing you're not going to do is see them riding on the bees like this. When the mites are in transport, they might be on the back of the bees, but almost universally a mite will be underneath and go in between the scales underneath the bee and bite into them. And they'll be tucked in there like a little blanket and you'll never see them on the underside of the bee. So the only way that you can determine whether you have mites or not is to monitor them in the method I'm gonna show you in a little bit. It's very unusual to see mites on the backs of the bees, but plant this in your mind. If you do see mites on the backs of the bees, boy, do you have a problem. Because <laughs> if they're to the point where they're riding around on the backs of the bees, you have so many of them that they're just gonna show up visible to you. Summer management. It seems really strange to think about winter when it's 90 degrees outside, but the summer bees and the early fall bees end up being the winter bees, if that's not clear. And it's at this time when you're under the most stress and uh, threat from the row mites that you actually need a clean colony in order to build winter bees. And as the population scales back, it makes the ratio of mites to bees even more. So this is a typical pattern. Let me just step out of this whole conversation and say, what's the normal thing for a typical beekeeper to do with functional hives that have been around? They take care of the varroa mites early in the year. 
their colony meanders through the spring doing well with attrition of bees from, you know, foraging and all the stuff that I spoke about. But eventually they too get to the point where mite saturation occurs. They pull their honey in early July. Fourth of July is traditional. And after they pull their honey, they focus on varroa mite treatments. That's the proper cadence of events in New Jersey, given our spring starts in April. So we're no different, except that you guys probably started with packages and or nukes that hopefully your provider managed for mites. And the number of mites in your colony should not be as high ratio as a production colony that came out over winter and someone didn't do something with the bees and it started with more mites. You hopefully started with no or next to no mites and therefore the growth population curve in a beginner colony is going to be a little bit lower, should be. The only way you know though is to monitor. But the key thing, the key takeaway for you, whether it's your first year or whether your fifth year, is you need to grasp that you cannot wait till September to take care of any mite problem that might be manifesting because the bees that are there from July, August into September either are going to feed or be overwintering bees and they have to be healthy as possible. So your job is to count it backwards. If I think about it, October 31st is typically the time period when we want to close the bees down because that will be the time period when most of the time cold weather could come into New Jersey. Now there's days when it stays or years that it stays warm through to Thanksgiving and you could watch the football games in your t-shirt. And there's even years where warmth goes till December but there's other years where you're out there at Halloween wearing a winter jacket. You don't know which it's going to be. So assume it's October 31st and count it backwards. And that means by August 8th, you should be counting that those are your winter bees. You need, if bees come out, workers, every 21 days, 21 days, 21 days, 21 days, 21 days, that gives you four or five cycles between August and October to build clean winter bees. So yeah, June and July is the time you monitor and treat if need be. And you want them to be building clean bees by beginning of August. So if you didn't get the gist of the message, the summary is <laughs> June, July, August to November timeframe, that's where you build your winter bees. And we're going to talk about something, but I want to share an idea with you is this Honeybee Health Coalition is everything you need to know about varroa mites, primers, treatment, understanding the different products that are out there, mite dynamics, videos for monitoring. We typically tell people, don't listen to us, follow this. We follow it. Even seasoned beekeepers open up this guide and follow it and do the re regiment that comes from it. It's honeybeehealthcoalition.org is the website. And one thing that I will say that they do, which I'm going to be a bit controversial about, they want you to monitor. And if the monitoring requires treatment, then you would treat, otherwise you would not. I will also tell you that what they say is, and this should not be relevant to you, but I'll use my example. I have two dozen colonies. I can monitor five, six of them, a certain percentage. And if I find high varroa mites, I'm not gonna monitor every single one. I'm gonna assume that the rest of the, the colony is in the same state and I'm gonna treat everything. In your case, if you have one or two hives, you can monitor them. And if you find they don't need treatment, you can save your money by not treating them and not subject the bees to the harshness of the treatment. The controversial part that I was mentioning is nowadays, even seasoned beekeepers, they monitor, 
they find out that they have mites, duh, and they treat. <laughs> so some of them just flat out skip treating or monitoring and just treat. I don't know if that's a great idea. Um, how will you know if a colony is impacted? And the first question I'm going to ask you is, did you monitor it? Do you know what the mite levels are? If you say no, then I could say, I can't really tell you what happened to it. So the advocates here, Honeybee Health Coalition say, you should monitor every month, especially in the time period from May, June, July, when mites are going to be at their peak, July, August, and so on. There's one last thing to be said about this is that there are times when colonies get so impacted by mites that they tend to abscond or do whatever. Go out in the neighborhood. You might have heard the term, you know, that people talk about bee bombs, where they're spreading mites throughout the neighborhood. If there's truth to that, it's yet to be proven whether that's actually factually right or not then most colonies that are overwhelmed by mites, let's pretend we did nothing. We went through July, August, September, the mite threshold just continued. The bees are completely overwhelmed and they leave the colony for, for the reasons that the colony is just not suitable for them to live there anymore. Everything is sick and it's a bad environment. Where are they going? To your hive. And so there's advocates out there that say, you need to monitor all the way through to October maybe even December, to make sure that you did not earn a penalty from hives that joined yours in some way and brought varroa mites. And I will tell you over years of experience that that actually does happen, right? Uh, that was introduced to that by a master beekeeper, Landy Simone, who treated all our colonies, thought everything was all right. And then in early days when they didn't advocate this, Happened to monitor late in fall and her hives were mite laden. And she knew it wasn't from her bees because she had done every colony in her, in her apiary. So one of the things that I spoke about earlier is varroa mites live with the brood. So you have to sample the bees to see whether they have mites on them. You're not going to get them out of the cells because if they're there, they're underneath the capping. But if a varroa mite is looking for a home to go in and reproduce, which is what it's biologically designed to do, then it's going to hang around on the bees near the brood. That means the workers. So if you're going to sample you're going to sample workers that are hanging around brood in all stages, brood that's being developed, brood that is almost ready to be kept because right at the end of its development, a mite is going to hop off the nurse carrier bee and go into the cell and then it'll get capped with the larva. So what I'm going to do is show you a couple frames, don't answer it yet, and say, is this a good one to sample? This is a brood frame, right? You can see that there's nurse bees tending to the brood. By the way, um, there's some queen cells down on the bottom. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> That's what they look like, Mr. Peanut, right? Um, so is this a good frame? Hold on to that. Is this a good frame? Is this a good frame? Is this a good frame? So the answer to these, and again, this is just me kind of talking out loud. If we look at the state of these, let's start with this one. This is a full carpet of brood. There's no place for the varroa mite to go into a cell to be developed because they're all capped. Now, typically these frames are occupied by workers and drones, and maybe you be okay to celebrate shaking them off and testing them because they're probably workers. They're in the brood area, but this is probably not the right frame you want to work at. There's a better choice. Is this a good frame? This is that frame we were just looking at, not literally, 
but a little bit later, right? The brood has emerged through the middle and chances are the queen is gonna come in here and start laying eggs through this center patch. And as the bees emerge, she'll continue to fill it all the way to the outside edge. What you should register is these bees just emerged, the hole is small, and anything that's in there is an egg or an early larva. It's not worm, you know, almost a pupa size. This one's a little bit premature. Now, are there viral mites on these workers? Yes, because it's a brood area. So is it a terrible choice? No, not necessarily. Now, if I go to the opposite, this one, there's nothing going on here. Now you have brood in all stages, right? I'm sorry, the picture is a little blurry, but you see there's eggs, there's larvae, there's worms. Nothing's capped. If I saw the worms in the middle, C-shaped larva, larger all the way across, I might pick bees. And by the way, this was um, to show you the graduation. The bees were shaken off. But what's on this thing? Workers all the way through, you know? Now, this one actually is good, and you can't tell it, but what I know, and I'm going to tell you, is that there were larvae all the way through that entire area in the circle. Any moment now, every single one of those would have been capped. What does that tell you? That's the perfect place where the varroa mite are going to ride the bees and go into the cells. So read the brood pattern in all stages. And if the brood in all stages is towards the mature side of almost being capped, and you have a choice between that and, and the other frames, pick that one. I'll just pause and let you absorb that. But, but this is the right answer. And I wish I could turn this and show you all the larva in here, but you know I'm telling you that it was full of larva all the way through the whole circle. This is Varroa Easy Check, and I'm just going to run down how to use it. I said you need rubbing alcohol. You fill it with rubbing alcohol. Most people fill it with rubbing alcohol and add water to it to save money on rubbing alcohol usage. You could use windshield washer fluid and other things, Dawn soap, whatever will kill the bees instantly when you dump them in there. Now, I know what I just said. You're going to kill the bees. When you do an alcohol wash, which is what we recommend, especially this time of year, you'd sacrifice the bees. Now, you have to understand that sacrificing a cup of bees is worth it when you're talking about a colony that has 30 to 50,000 bees in it. It's a rounding error for the final population. They lose 1,000 bees a day during the peak period. Mm. So you're not really impacting the population by this sample in any way. And if you find out that you need to treat and you fix a colony, think of the number of bees that you save. It'll be far more than the ones you sacrificed. So go through your brood, pick the proper frame. What's the one bee you don't want to sample? Your queen. <laughs> Okay, so you see the queen, she's got a green dot. She's not where I'm pointing. She's a little bit forward of that. One of the good reasons to mark your queen. Hopefully she'll be easier to find. If this is a brood frame that you're going to sample from and you shake it off, you don't want to shake the queen into the sample and kill her, obviously. The ideal thing would be you'd go through your brood frames in the bottom of the box usually find your queen tuck her away for safekeeping and then go through and pick the right frame and shake it off guaranteed you have no queen you can feel free to proceed okay now sometimes you have to look carefully right because this is what it looked like she's in there but you don't have the benefit of her being free and marked do you see her She's right where I'm pointing. You can see her abdomen, but her head is covered. So when you're looking for your queen, this is the one time we'll say to you, be very careful. Don't sample your queen. Do you see her? I, can you see my mouse? It's right here. 
Is my mouse showing up on the presentation? Yes, it is. Okay, so you see, see where she is. Yeah. Okay. Now, sometimes this is what it looks like. Holy crap, where am I going to find the queen in here? It's a train wreck in trying to find her. A little tip for you. Take the colony where you're not sure where the queen is and shake it over the box. Almost any time you shake the bees off, excess, the queen doesn't fall off. She's not in the habit of being shook off the frame. So if your colony is just so booming and you can't find the queen, but you'd really like to make sure you find the queen before you do a sample, shake the bees over and then look at the frame again. Now, could you shake the queen down into the colony? Yeah, it's possible. And then you have to start all over again. There's one other thing is if you go through and you're not comfortable doing this on your own and you don't find the queen, you can button everything up come back another day and do it again until you find the queen. There's nothing that says you, a sample of one day versus another day is really not going to be material to the bees. So you play, I, I, the only reason I talk about all this is because I've had beekeepers go, well, what if I can't find the queen? I have to give you the answer. The answer is then close everything up if you're not comfortable and come back and do it again or bring somebody in that can help you find the queen if you're that way. This is the actual sample process. You're going to take the sample that you want, the frame, with no queen. You're going to hold it over your container. That one in the picture is a little small, about as small as you want to get. You might want to get one like twice the size of that. And you can tell by the picture that I've held the frame up and down, and I've cleaned the end bar off, and I have taken my fist and I struck it as hard as I could. Obviously I'm holding it tight in the other hand so I don't bang it out of my hand. But that wrap to the frame makes all the bees fall down into the container down below. If you've never tried this, give it a try. You could take your roof off or your inner cover sometimes and you go to put it on and it's covered with bees, hold it vertically over it and give it a wrap with your fist and all the bees will fall off into the top and then you can just set your roof down and not worry about squishing bees. You're going to take your measuring cup. You'll take the, if you did the package, you know what I mean by this. Tap it down, turn it, tap it down and all the bees will collect down at the bottom and then just use your measuring cup to scoop. You take your measuring cup of bees and you put them in your varroa check. Half cup of bees is 300. That's the right number. You cover it off and shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Now, again, these bees are going to perish from this. So what our recommendation is, put the bees in, put the cover on, and set it aside. Take any of the extra bees that you had and return them to the colony. Take a moment to give them back and close the colony up. You don't need to be in there anymore. Now you're going to go to the side and you're going to shake that container like you're shaking a cocktail. And you're going to shake it for a long time. What you're trying to do here is a couple things. Remember when I said the row might are lodged inside, underneath, tucked in, and they're really encamped underneath the, the bees' plates, if I could just use generic terms. You have to dislodge the mite out from under there. The, the bees have a waxy, oily coating, and so do the varroa mites, and their uh, feet have a waxy, oily coating, and it helps them to hold on. Part of shaking them is to get it coated and it dissolves that and it helps it to fall off. Also, the vigorous motion of banging the bees around inside the liquid and having them hit the internal side of dislodges everything. You're going to 
have legs dislodged and the antenna and all that other stuff. I mean, that's just the, the amount that you're going to shake it. When you're finished shaking, and I'm talking about two to three minutes, maybe longer, you're going to hold the container with the lid up and you're going to swirl the liquid around, hopefully swishing the, the mites off and have them come down through the grid. Now, one thing about this device in particular, the grid is pretty robust. It's very thick. The holes are fine, but a lot of times it's hard to get the varroa mite to fall through this particular device. You've got to do the swirl motion. When you hold the container up and look in the bottom, you're going to see the varroa mites. You see the round as opposed to unusual shapes and they're brick red. It's pretty evident there, right? How many mites I have? How many do I have? I see seven in the sample. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, when you go back to the Honey Bee Health Coalition, they'll tell you, is seven good or bad? You count seven mites per 300 bees is a ratio. And they'll tell you that's a percentage of X. If you're over two to three percent, you should treat. If you're under that, you don't have to. So you just count the mites. By the way, what is that? That's a stinger that got shaken off of a bee. Now, this thing got set down the container on something, and it's got all this debris on the bottom, which doesn't help matters. But it's pretty evident what a mite looks like in the sample. Right? So seven mites divided by three, that's how you do the formula, is a 2.3% infestation. There's a rule of thumb for some people that they want to see 1%, some say 2%, the original was 3%. You have to kind of gauge, and I would follow the Varroa Coalition. The reason that it went from 3% down to 1% is because when Varroa mites are there, they've become more vir virulent, hate that word, can never say it. But they impact the bees far more than they did way back in the beginning when we were dealing with varroa mites. So they've lowered the percentage. Now, the percentage you should be focused on changes during the year based on the population of the bees. So I won't tell you that 2% is bad or 3% is bad. You have to go see the coalition and say, this time of year for this thing, 2% is the highest and you should treat if you're above that which 2.3 would be above that. Now, this is seven, which puts you right somewhere in the threshold. Sometimes it looks like this. <laughs> this is shaken, I think this is Bob's, shaken out of one sample that we had. Uh, you have a very bad mite problem here. And I'll be honest with you, it's really not out of the question sometimes to get in the high 16, 20, 25 mites be like, holy cow, this, this hive is dead and it doesn't know it. Um, and there's, there's no doubt when you look at them, they're all full mature mites. If you don't address the situation, you end up with this. When all the bees become sick over summer, they develop parasitic mite syndrome. In essence, the population dies. There's a lot of dead sick bees. The brood doesn't work. It becomes European fowl brood. And, you know, things just totally implode. This is, you never want to get to the state where your colony brood patterns look like this. But if you don't take care of varroa mites, this is in your future. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to stop right there and I want to open the floor for, for all my questions.
and see if anybody has anything they want to ask me about what we spoke of. Is it a surprise? Or did you all know this already? Anybody, this is like eye opening for them? Just you just, I can see most of you made your. Okay. So, needless to say, when we come for our mentor visits, what are we going to focus on? We're going to make sure that you get a raw my check. So, mentor is going to come to your home. And this is the way it works. We're not going to tell you who your mentor is. Your mentor is going to pick you. Most of the time, what happens is we will find out where you are. Uh, if you're in Flemington, I live in Ringo's. I'll come see you. Or Bob will come see you because he lives near Flemington. If you're out in Pittstown, then maybe Laura will come see you because she's from there. If you're from Warren County, maybe Greg will come see you because he's up there or somebody else. It should be convenient. And, and this is the point where I say the mentors have their own hives and families and other things during summer. We all know how busy summer comes, vacations and such. So ideally, we try to make it as convenient for them as possible. And we will, like, like matchmaking, match you up with a mentor to come visit you. And they come with a standard set of instructions. All of the mentors get the same instruction set. And they'll come and help you with those things. And hopefully they'll be able to give us a report card. That's what we do about your colonies. And then if there's some sort of remediation needed, we build a plan for you. So we'll do a hive inspection. Let me say that differently you <laughs> will do a hive inspection. It's not a test on your hive inspection skills. We went over how to do hive inspections in the program, and we're just gonna reinforce ways to do it, which frame to pull first, how to use your hive tool, how to understand what you're looking at. If you've not mastered that yet, we'll help you through. But we wanna watch you do it and make sure that we can give you any pointers to make it go better for you. And starting from you'll light the smoker, you'll open the hive, you'll do the hive inspection, you'll talk about what you're seeing and things like that. And all the while, if you have questions, you feel free to ask while you have them there. It should be comfortable for everybody. If you want your queen marked, if you didn't buy a mark queen, and the mentor's okay to do it, it's not a skill that everybody has, even mentors, then we'll mark your queen for you. Do understand that even me at home, I've killed queens trying to mark them just because of oops. It happens, but that's very rare. If something happens, we'll mitigate that situation for you, of course. Um, but if you want your queen mark, just yell. And we will do, as we just showed, that exact process of mite monitoring for you and we'll get a sample. Now, what we've done in the past is say to people, uh, your option, you can have varroa mite treatments ready to go, or you can wait till it monitors. And then if you find that you need it, you can order them. Um, we can work that out with you. And when your mentor calls to make arrangements or whatever, you can discuss disclose to them, yeah, I want to treat right away if I find mites, or no, I'll buy the stuff after you're done if I need it, that kind of thing. Just give me a heads up. We will send people to Hunter in and Warren County. Uh, we've had people in our program here this year that have come from Somerset. There was one that wanted to come from uh, Mercer County and such. It's not fair for our local beekeepers to have to travel counties away to help people. So we've always set the boundary of Hunter Dean and Warren. If you're in Warren County or, you know, I'm sorry, Sussex County and you're across the street from Warren County, we won't be that fussy, but we're not going to high point. <laughs> okay. So this is the way you do this. 
send a message to nwnjba at live.com, the email address, and give us the basic information. What's your name? Where do you live? What kind of colonies do you have in place? Give us a description of your house, maybe some directions if it's hard to find. And I will then solicit for mentors in your area. And when I find a match, someone will reach out and contact you. So please, you know, phone number and all that stuff. Now, we have a database of everybody that's a member at Northwest and we have your contact information. But for the sake of this, just repeat the information, please, and send it in an email and we'll come out. This is the last slide. Um, we're at the close of the presentation part and I will open the floor to do a round table for beekeepers to talk.